This morning we're going to be reflecting upon uh, Acts chapter 19. If we could put the first slide up for us. I just want to give ourselves a little bit of a cultural context where we'll be uh, this morning. And um, uh, our passage takes place in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was uh, about 250,000 people lived in this city back in Paul's day. Uh, they had one of the largest amphitheaters of that time. It could hold about 50,000 people in this particular amphitheater. And uh, not only that, they had uh, this huge uh, temple to Diana in this uh, city. This temple was so big, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world back then. The pyramids of Egypt were another one. Uh, the Rhodes, uh, Colossa, Rhodes was another, and then uh, this one. And so it was... Uh, 320 feet, if I remember correctly, in a football field, it's 220 feet. So this, this, this temple was astronomical. It was big. And uh, so they had that going on. They also had uh, 14 different temples to different gods there, including this temple to Diana. Uh, and it was also one of the things that happened in this city was that if you showed up at this temple, uh, you could get asylum, and so there was a lot of there was a, criminals who came to this city so that you get outside the arm of the law, and so there was a criminal element here in this city also. Uh, the temple, the uh, goddess Diana was a fertility goddess. And she was covered with breast, and so there was a lot of uh, uh, lust and uh, other things that happened uh, in the city of Ephesus. The apostle Paul is called to this particular city, and as he arrives there, one of the things that burdened on his heart. It was a dark place. Satan had power in this particular place. And one of the things that Paul was passionate about is that God would not be robbed of his glory. And so he enters into this particular uh, city and uh, in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, and he has a burden. And so the question that you have to ask yourselves as a missionary, when you arrive in a place, how can you bring the gospel to this particular place? And so that's the question that we're going to be pondering this morning. How do you bring the gospel to Goshen? How do you bring it to Chester? How do you bring it to Middletown? How do you bring it to Sussex? Whatever town that we're living in, how do we bring God's message there? And so the Apostle Paul gives us a little bit of a, uh, an outline, an insight into how it worked for him in his day. And so uh, that's where we're going to be going this morning. Um, and so we're going to be reading from the Acts chapter 19. We're reading the first 20 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Now, Corinth is over in Greece. Uh, geographically, I don't know how you guys are all with geography. Um, Ephesus is over in, in Turkey. It's uh, south of Istanbul. Uh, but in any case, that's where uh, Paul was heading. He was heading to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing pervasive, pervasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them and he took his disciples with him, and he had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrrhenius. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest... Jewish pre chief priests were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, 
but who are you? Then a man who had an evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. And after, after having been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. Thus far, the reading of God's word from Acts chapter 19. How can we effectively minister in our places and have an impact? And as we ponder that question, Paul had to wrestle with that also. Paul had a burden on his heart. God was being robbed of his glory here. God says, I will share my glory with no one. And so he comes to Ephesus, and Diana's being worshipped. He had all these other gods being worshipped. And back then, the way they thought about things was, if you needed help for war, you would give some incense to Zeus. If you wanted help with your uh, romantic relationship, there was another god that you would worship. And if you wanted help with, uh, in the air, in, uh, with argumenting, uh, you would worship another god. And so they had all these different gods, had these different spears. And, and Paul says, there's one god. There's not all these gods. Who's in charge of it all? And so Paul brings the message here. And the first thing that Paul discovers when he enters this particular city of Ephesus, he notices that there are some disciples that are already there. And that's a sign that God is already at work before we arrive in a particular location. There was 12 men who had traveled all the way over to the Jordan River and were baptized by John the Baptist. And they traveled from, John the, from the Jordan River all the way back to Ephesus, and they were in Ephesus. And when Paul gets there, he finds these 12 disciples who are God are already planted in this city. They were bringing the light of the gospel to this city. And so the first thing that I want to share with you is that God is at work in people's lives before you and I enter into people's life. God is at work in your life all the way through. And so that was the first thing that Paul discovered. The second thing that I want to just highlight and that is extremely important, Paul felt a burden that he needed to bring the gospel to the Jews first. And so he enters into the synagogues. And as he's in the synagogue, he's proclaiming the message. He's proclaiming the gospel in the synagogue. And we hear that as he's proclaiming the gospel in the synagogue, that there are, uh, that there's some maligned the way, there's some who gave him resistance, there's some who pushed it back against the, the gospel. And so we're told that Paul gets up and he leaves after three months. Now, it seems like there was 12 people there already there in the city who were disciples, but I think that some people from the synagogue also became part of his fellowship. And so he goes to a school. He goes to the hall of Tyrenius, it says in the, in, the, in the scriptures. And what does he do? He proclaims the gospel. And one of the things that is absolutely critical for us is that God uses preaching and teaching of his word. And Paul says, I'm going to invest there. And so he's in the hall of Tyrenius and he's preaching and teaching in that particular location. What happens here on the pulpit from week to week, year after year, decade after decade, is important. It's significant. It bears fruit. God says, my word will go out and it will not return to me empty or void. God says that. And so I just thank God for your church here in Goshen where the word is faithfully proclaimed week after week, year after year. It's a beautiful thing. And we want to continue to do that. We don't want to say that we're going to try to worship God. There's different ways to introduce people to God. But Paul says, this is where I'm going to invest because God says, how will they not know unless someone preaches to them? So Paul is preaching and teaching. And it's important for us to also do that. Now, that was, uh, so the first he notices that, that God was already there, at work there. The second thing that we notice is that uh, he is preaching and teaching. But the third thing that we notice is that there was a power encounter. 
And when I say that, there's these, uh, his preaching and teaching was so effective that other people noticed that God was working through Paul. And as a result, they said, you know, there's some power behind this name of Jesus. And so there's these seven sons of Sceva, who's a chief priest. They're connected with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they say, there's, Paul has something special going on here, and we want to tap into that power. And these seven sons of Sceva had a good heart. They noticed that somebody was afflicted by a demon. And they said, we want to see this person experience freedom. And so they enter into this person's life and they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches, we command you to get out. And they might have had success some other time, but in this particular case, it wasn't successful. And so I'd just like to ponder with you a moment, what happened for those seven sons of Sceva? Because it seems like their hearts were in the right place. They noticed that these, this, this, this person was wrapped in chains. This person was bound up because of darkness, because of Satan in his life. And let me tell you, I believe that right here in Goshen, the same thing can happen, that we see things that bother us. There's things that trouble us. We see that the world around us and people whom we know, they are locked up because of some kind of power in their lives, and it's painful. We see it, and we just want to see them experience freedom. And yet, as we watch, what do we do? And we pray for them, and we share the gospel with them. And these seven sons, they say, we know that there's a God that's in this universe that's greater than the thing that's afflicting you, and we want to see you have freedom. Now, I'm going to be a little pointed here this morning, because the world looks at the church today and believes that the church is weak. Not only believe the church is weak, they believe the church is powerless. The church does not have power to bring freedom to our hurting, aching world. And, and the question is, well, what's going wrong for the seven sons of Sceva? Why didn't they have success? It seems like they were doing the right thing. They were connected with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their father was a chief priest. And what I want to present to you this morning, what is absolutely critical in your life and in mind, is that we are not talking about Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches. This was a second-hand God for them. They weren't connected to Jesus. They saw Paul and him having success and said, we are calling on that God that Paul is calling on. And it was a second-hand God. How many people today say, we're a Christian because we were Catholic? We're a Christian because we're Christian Reformed? We're a Christian because we're Baptist? We're a Christian because we're Presbyterian? We're a Christian because we have all the right verses and, the, and things in our head that are correct? And God says, and the demonic world looks at us and says, who are you? That's what they said to the seven sons of Sceva. Who are you? And they looked at him and said, you are powerless. And what do they do? They beat them up. Wow. As the demonic world looks at Goshen Christian Reformed Church, looks at you and me, what do they see? Because they're watching and they know. If you are filled with Jesus, let me tell you, you will be like Paul. Where the demons will see you and say, we can't touch him. We can't touch her. We're going to have to obey because that person has a power in them that we can't stop. But if we're talking about Paul's God and a second-hand God that we're not connected to, then guess what? The demons will beat us up and we're going to walk out of there naked and bleeding and everything else and humiliated. And so what was one of the things that was wrong for the seven sons of Sceva? They weren't connected. It was a second-hand God. The second thing that I want to bring to our attention this morning, which is absolutely critical in the world in which we live today, there are so many people who say, I can't believe in the virgin birth. I can't believe in miracles. I can't believe in the resurrection. I can't believe in this and that. Well, you know something? There was a time when the Apostle Paul looked at Jesus and said, I can't believe in him. And he thought that he was wrong. This is 
This is something that's totally um, apostate, and we need to cleanse this from Judaism. And Paul was opposed to Jesus Christ. Today, if we think that we can pick and choose what we believe, guess what? We have just weakened our belief and our faith, and as a result of weakening our faith, the demonic world looks at us and says, do they really stand for Jesus or don't they? Have they embraced him or are they fragmentized? And because they're a fragmentation, they have no backbone to against what we have to say, what, 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 what we're doing in the world around us in Ephesus, in Goshen, or wherever we are. And let me tell you, the seven sons of Sceva were humiliated. Did they have the heart in the right place? Absolutely. And so when we have our hearts in the right place, it's not only important for that to happen, but it's also important for us to be connected. Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, as Kim and Sky professed, who is your Lord and Savior? What did they say? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And when we think about that, that profession of faith is so powerful that we sometimes forget how powerful and significant that is. Jesus, you're the reason. Jesus, I'm not going to worry about the outcome of the world and what's happening around me. But I'm going to know that as I trust in you, you will do things through me that are beyond my imagination or even what I can comprehend. One of the, uh, one of the beautiful stories that uh, I like to share, I've been talk, telling you, I've been work, they asked if I would serve down the street at uh, Glenwood Baptist Church, and they're struggling and have other stuff going on. And so uh, they gave me three pages of people who used to attend there. So I emailed, texted, or called every person on the list and uh, there was one woman that I met with, and she used to be the church secretary years ago. And so I met with her. And uh, she says, I would like to come back to church. And I said, welcome back. And so she came. And then I was preaching on the Acts, because we were going through the book of Acts, on Acts 3, where the John and uh, Peter come to the temple. And, uh, and Peter says to the, that, that man who was lying, lame at the, at the gate of the temple called Beautiful, he says, rise up and walk. And the man didn't get up and walk. But then he took his hand out there and he said, rise up and walk. And he took the man by the hand and he pulled him up. And the man went through the temple, leaping and praising and thanking God. Well, what happened? And the question that I asked the congregation was, who was the person in your life that extended the hand to you and lifted you? And later on, that, that, uh, later on after I shared that message, she came up to me and she says, you were that person for me. And... Sometimes God uses us to bring people to Jesus. And it's beautiful when we see that happening. But you know what? It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And what did Paul, as he was bringing the message to the people in Ephesus, it wasn't about Paul. Paul says, Jesus is about you. And we want you not to be robbed of your glory and your honor. And so that's the, that's the third thing. First, there was a disciples already there in the city of Ephesus. Second, Paul proclaimed the gospel. Fourth, their third, third, there was a power demonstration within the city. And, uh, and one of the things, they brought handkerchiefs and other things, and pe people were healed uh, of different things. But the fourth thing that I want to bring to our attention, and that is that there was these uh, scrolls that uh, people had in their houses. And uh, not only that, there was this uh, powerful thing of sorcery going on in the city of Ephesus. Sorcery is connected with the demonic world, and it's dark. It's evil. And people had the awakening of God that took place in the city of Ephesus. And as that light shone on the city of Ephesus, what happened for these people? They said... There is stuff in my closet that is worth a lot of money. And even though it's worth a lot of money, I got to get it out. I got to get, because I know that is not honoring my God and Savior. And so what happened in the city of Ephesus? You can't see it. I can't see it. But they opened that door up. 
and they got that stuff out of that thing, those scrolls, and all that stuff was worth a lot of money. And they put it in a pile. And we hear that they lit a fire to it. And we think, you could have sold that stuff and made a lot of money. And they say, we don't want the money. We want to get rid of that stuff. Because we know that that stuff is just interfering with our relationship with God. And my friends, the question as we think about what took place in the city of Ephesus is what about our lives? What's in the closet back there in our lives that's a mess? What's in that closet that's just dirty, filthy, it's connected with the evil? Or are we willing, even if it's worth 20,000 drachmas or whatever the price that they collected all together, are we willing to put it out and say, God, that's interfering with my relationship with you. Are we willing to pull it out? Let it burn. Let it go. Because, Jesus, you're the reason. You're the thing that brings light into my life. And not only do you bring light into my life, you bring wholesomeness into my life that I can't find any other place. And so what happened in the city of Ephesus? This fascinating event took place. They burned it. Now, let me tell you, the world watches on. And I'll bet you that that fire that took place that night was probably more powerful than some of the sermons that the Apostle Paul preached. And people talked about it. And what do we hear? I think it's in verse 17. What, it ha- what did they say? Is that... The, the, uh, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. But not only that, in verse 17 it says, When this became known to the Greeks and Jews living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Now, what I can tell you is that I see a lot of people, and, and oftentimes I find that the name of Jesus is not held in high honor. It uses a swear word. It's a curse word. But what happened here is these people experienced Jesus Christ. And they said Jesus' name is a name that's to be honored and glorified and held in high honor. And so as we think about reaching our community, wherever we're planted, I just want to highlight that God is already at work in our communities, first of all. Second of all, we need to be willing to proclaim the gospel. We need to be able to talk about Jesus and what he's done for us in our lives. But not only that, there are those times where there's going to be those power encounters where we're going to come right up against the enemy and, uh, and things are going to happen that we might not ever dream about or envision is going to happen. It happened to the seven sons of Sceva. But not only that, the third thing that we notice is that there was a cleansing that took place. There was that fire. And so as we think about our lives and what's going on, do we need to do personal homework? And if we do, there's one of the most beautiful things that when we're in the hands of Jesus, we're safe. And, and we bring glory to him because all, that, all those scrolls could go up in flames and the city of Ephesus was a transformed place. Now, if you read a little farther, and I challenge you to read a little farther, what happened is that there was a riot, and people who were making the idols were being affected, and we hear that there was a great work that was taking place there. But my passion is that Jesus Christ will be honored and not robbed of his glory in your life and my life, and continue to be honored and glorified here in this church. Let's pray. Father, we think about Matthew and being a gift. We thank you for each person here and how you've wired us, how you've made us. And Lord, we don't want you to be robbed of your glory. We know that you will share your glory with no one. And so we want to see, as in the city of Ephesus, A transformation, an awakening here in Goshen. Awakening in Orange County, an awakening in Sussex County. Awakening in Pike County, wherever we're from. 
And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will do things in, uh, in a greater way than we ever dreamt or even imagined. And so we commit ourselves into your hands, trusting that you alone are our Savior, that you're not a second-hand God for us, a second-hand person, but that you live in us, and that you are, as been professed earlier by Kim and Sky, you are our Lord and Savior. And we pray this in your name. Amen.